conference is narratives. Uh, and uh, yes, this is one possible alternative narrative or prophecy of the future. Now I say uh, prophecy, um, I think this is the correct term for you uh, to use because prediction suggests something that is definite, uh, certain, confident and exact, whereas what I'm going to talk about is speculative. But no less speculative is the, is the possibility of uh, Kurt's Weilian scenarios or the, or the scenarios of, let's say, the, uh, the Singularity Institute that uh, humans are essentially going to be uh, shortly replaced. Um, just uh, a little bit of background. Um, yes, the particular uh, strand of transhumanism I uh, represent have been most involved with is the abolitionist project. Um, the idea uh, that uh, over the next uh, few centuries, humans are progressively going to phase out the biology of suffering, not just uh, in uh, humans, but also in the rest of the living world. And the narrative that I have uh, traditionally uh, told has involved uh, germline engineering and the idea that with uh, the reproductive revolution of designer babies, prospective parents are increasingly going to choose uh, such things as the pain sensitivity or lack of it of their future offspring and most critically uh, the idea that uh, prospective parents are going to be choosing the set points of their offspring's hedonic, head mill, uh, hedonic treadmill uh, and the idea which uh, as I said uh, spe speculative and slow um, was that over uh, centuries essentially there would be extreme selection pressure against a lot of our nas nastier genes and allelic combinations, um, and th but that eventually our hedonic set points would be much higher, uh, and essentially the idea uh, that eventually uh, life, post-human life, will be based on gradients of intelligent bliss, theoretically at least, orders of magnitude richer than anything accessible today. And together with uh, utopian technology of tomorrow, it will be feasible uh, to uh, essentially micromanage every cubic uh, meter of the planet, which will be accessible uh, to management, surveillance, and control. Uh, and in our wildlife parks of the future, it will be essentially optional whether we have any form of suffering, whether we have predators that as they exist today. Essentially, any form of experience below hedonic zero uh, will be optional. However, as I said, that's a narrative and it's a prophecy, but uh, over the past uh, uh, decade or so, probably the dominant strand of transhumanism, I would say, has been some form of singularitarianism, whether the Kurtzsteinian variety or that of uh, the Singulari Singularity Institute. And so I'm going to be uh, today discussing a rather different, in some ways, more radical uh, uh, possibility, uh, which is that the end of the, uh, uh, the human era uh, is uh, imminent, and it's going to happen sometime in the, probably in the middle of this century. Um, we talk about uh, a superintelligence, but whatever superintelligence is, uh, I would say it's not going to be more restrictive uh, in its capacities uh, than humans. Uh, and humans have the capacity uh, to discuss uh, consciousness, its varieties, the binding problem, to explore altered states of consciousness, um, and it's by no means clear that classical digital computers uh, can do this. And so I would argue that full spectrum superintelligence is going to uh, entail mastery of both the subjective and the formal properties of mind. Now this distinction cannot be entirely cle uh, clean or else it wouldn't be possible for me to uh, allude to the subjective properties of mind in the first place, but uh, <coughs> nonetheless it's real. And I don't know if there are any behaviorists or uh, operationists in the audience who will say what is this thing called uh, consciousness or, or subjectivity. Um, all I would ask to them is uh, before uh, uh, anesthesia, would you demand uh, an anesthetic as well as a muscle relaxant? Um, a muscle relaxant will leave you fine for surgery. The, the surgeon can operate uh, uh, on you fine, um, but without a, a, an anesthetic, essentially you'll be in, you'll be in agony. What is this uh, perhaps impossible to define state of, of, of consciousness? Um, 
I think uh, that uh, to attain full spectrum super intelligence, um, it will be necessary to solve both the hard problem of consciousness and two, uh, the binding problem. Uh, how organic robots uh, succeed in solving the binding problem? I mean, how is it that apparently uh, discrete uh, membrane-brown classical uh, neurons distributively processing uh, edges, textures, shapes, motions uh, in the brain can somehow generate uh, bound objects and right now uh, a unitary uh, state of consciousness, state of mind. I mean, somehow in real time your mind-brain is generating this uh, world simulation and this guy with a funny English uh, accent who is talking to you today. Extraordinarily computationally powerful. If anyone has any doubt as to just how computationally powerful uh, object binding and the unity of uh, perception is, it's worth looking at various uh, uh, rare neurological symptoms where binding even partially breaks down, such as uh, simultaneous where someone can literally only see one object at once, or motion blindness, or for that matter, severe uh, schizophrenia. Extraordinarily uh, powerful. Um, and I would argue that the solution to the binding problem is also going to uh, deliver uh, a solution to, Mar to Moravec's paradox. Uh, why is it that uh, even this uh, supposedly humble bumblebee is far more uh, cognitively sophisticated, it can manipulate, uh, that it can navigate its environment in open field complex far more sophisticated than anything DARPA can come up with, uh, alpha dog and the like. Um, yes. Uh, I said I'm, I'm symbolizing these uh, different uh, uh, perspectives uh, with uh, particular, I expect you recognize uh, uh, Freeman Dyson, the other two figures need uh, no introduction, uh, uh, Red Kurzweil and Elisa Yukowski. Um, I won't, uh, I don't need to uh, uh, give an outline of uh, uh, Red Kurzweil and his uh, work, I think we recognize this uh, chart here, so I need to be short of time. Um, as well as the Kurtzweilian scenario, which is essentially extraordinarily optimistic, essentially that we are going to uh, fuse with our machines, the distinction between humans and machine intelligence is going to uh, disappear altogether, we're going to have uh, up uploading, very optimistic vision. There is also a much uh, darker vision, or, or a warning, shall we say, um, from a uh, mathematician, I.J. Good, and also, most recently, uh, the Singularity Institute. And the, the idea is essentially here that Moore's Law plus this idea of recursively self-improving software-based minds will culminate, culminate in a runaway intelligence explosion. Um, and barring breakthroughs in so-called friendly AI, uh, humans uh, are actually going to face extinction probably later this century, i.e. a non-friendly uh, singularity is quite likely. Um, now I'm just going to just say a very brief uh, note here on what we mean by friendly AI. Um, the term is commonly used uh, in the sense of human-friendly AI, but it is, I would argue, by no means clear that the notion of distinctively human friendliness is even intellectually coherent. I mean, one might, I mean, imagine if uh, in the uh, ultimate branches of the wave function where Nazis won the Second World War, uh, Aryan scientists were, were warning about the danger to the, uh, the master race of, 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 uh, 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 of, of non-Aryan friendly superintelligence. So I'm going to, unless otherwise specified, use the term uh, 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 to mean sentience friendly. But what does sentience friendliness actually uh, entail? Clearly there are uh, beyond the well-being uh, of, of, of sentience. A whole host of, of various scenarios uh, can be uh, sketched. Could be the kind of the high-tech uh, Jainism. Um, of course, Jains who sweep the uh, uh, the ground in front of them. Uh, we tend to think of them as pretty stupid. Um, well, we wouldn't put it like this, but uh, uh, nonetheless, that is what most people in the West think. But implicitly, this is what we are asking a notional post-human superintelligence uh, to do: to have a Jain-like concern. Uh, for extraordinarily primitive, humble creatures. So um, that is one conception of sentience friendliness. Um, life based on gradients of intelligent bliss. This is um, what I would personally advocate. The advantage of 
uh, gradients of intelligent bliss, i.e. recalibrating the hedonic treadmill, uh, is that it's not necessary to choose between yeah, different utilitarian, uh, preference utilitarian, classical utilitarian, deontological conceptions, virtue, virtue ethics. It is, it, it is neutral between different conceptions uh, of, uh, of, 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 our, of our future, um, but at the same time vastly increases uh, our, our subjective well-being. Um, I'm not going to uh, outline uh, some of the reasons why uh, singularitarians in the, in the common sense uh, actually uh, uh, believe uh, that humans, apparently slow, primitive humans, are on our way out. Um, but I do just want to at least sketch an alternative uh, scenario. And as I said, apologies, I have no uh, graph showing exponential growth. The technology here I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about doesn't yet exist. Um, germline engineering, as we know, is, going, is, 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 is slow. Even when there is, uh, as I would anticipate later this century, a reproductive revolution of designer babies, um, uh, uh, essentially, it is it, it, it's going to take place, uh, one would uh, suppose, over generations. Whereas, uh, essentially, uh, organic robots, on the other hand, are going to be using software editing tools uh, to, uh, first of all, with individual genes, uh, then uh, 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 combinations of genes, uh, and eventually whole suites of genes uh, to essentially re-edit our own genome, biohacking. Um, and the smarter our uh, tool AI, so to speak, uh, uh, the, uh, the greater our capacity uh, for recursive self-improvement. And so essentially, I would argue that the proportionality thesis, increases in intelligence lead to proportionate increases in the capacity to design intelligent systems, is actually is going to hold uh, for organic robots uh, too. Um, now, the next speaker is going to uh, talk about mind uploading. I haven't got time to discuss uh, this now. Uh, and instead, uh, I'm going to uh, end on uh, uh, there's four controversial uh, predictions um, that uh, perhaps we can uh, discuss later, but I won't do now. And these four predictions are, one, classical digital computers will never be non-trivially conscious. Two, software-based minds are physically impossible. The strong physical church, the ch church Turing thesis is false. Three, humans will never upload our minds. The phenomenal binding problem defeats the possibility of our digital emulation. And four, future, well, we won't go into uh, quantum mind uh, theory now, but uh, I would just like to say that anyone who thinks it is inevitable that primitive organic robots are going to be consigned to the dustbin of history, um, there are alternative arguments. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Come back up here. We have time for one or two quick questions. I want to do that courtesy, so come back up here. Okay. okay. Um, let's pass the mic up to Consensus? Comments? <laughs> I love consensus. So, uh, let's see here. Yeah. I had a question. Is the mic working? Yeah, there we are. I had a question about, um, so, so you, talk, you started your talk saying you want to eliminate suffering, and my question is, what is the scope of that? I mean. One view is that only humans uh, can suffer, and therefore the scope of what you're talking about only applies to humans. You made a reference to Jainism, uh, which would apply to non-humans. Uh, where, where, what kinds of things can suffer? And if you can't come down on which, you know, whether a dog suffers or an insect suffers, how would we decide? Uh, even if you don't have a clear line, how would we decide what constitutes as worthy of having this suffering eliminated? For a start, one can't defeat radical skepticism. Um, but I, I cannot uh, uh, prove that anyone here is sentient who uh, might be zombies. However, a convergence uh, of, of evidence uh, from behavioral evidence to genetic evidence to neurochemical ev evidence 
suggests uh, that uh, uh, that uh, certainly vertebrates, but way probably way beyond vertebrates, uh, have a uh, capacity to suffer. Any creature with a central nervous system, and one can actually look, uh, uh, do electrode studies of the brain, and, and see what are the actual biological substrates of, uh, of, of raw pain and, and uh, pleasure. Uh, something like, for instance, the, uh, the SCN9A gene, uh, nonsense mutations abolish the capacity to experience pain, uh, other mutations confer uh, a greater susceptibility to pain or uh, a lesser susceptibility of pain, and you'll find this uh, this gene in other in other vertebrates. Um, it's very easy to assume that, uh, that that consciousness is somehow some kind of late evolutionary novelty. But if one actually looks at the brain and does uh, studies, one finds that the most intense forms of consciousness are actually evolutionary, ancient, and primitive in the limbic system. And this is something we can do right now, you see. Uh, in, in, in our future of, uh, offspring, one can use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. You could, you could choose the uh, level of pain sensitivity in your, in, in your future offspring. One will be able to do this uh, in our wildlife parks too. Essentially, choosing the level of, of, of suffering and malaise uh, that we want to exist in the living world. Uh, once again, I have not definitively answered uh, your question, uh, but I don't uh, think non-human animal uh, suffering raises any distinct questions from, uh, from human suffering. We are, uh, it, it would be pre-Darwinian to distinguish between animals and humans. Thank you very much. It seems that you're suggesting that the hedonic scale is, is, is not relative. Um, you're, you're suggesting that it's absolute? Is that Indeed. Sadly, today, there are people who are chronically depressed and in pain. And is one going to tell them that because they cannot contrast their state of misery with happiness, uh, in some ways, is any less real? Conversely, there are some people who spend almost their entire life uh, above hedonic uh, zero. Um, I'm just going to give one case study with his express permission. The transhumanist uh, uh, Anders Sandberg. Essentially, he is extraordinarily high functioning, but he lives his life gradients of well-being. And over time, it's going to be possible to shift globally hedonic set points in the direction of a much richer quality of life uh, for all. Thank you.